think you are ready to go. All right. Thanks, everyone, for showing up here. Thanks to Matthew and the Natural History Society of Maryland for setting up this event and giving me a platform to talk about frogs and amphibians and save the frogs and how all of us can uh, work together to ensure that amphibians and amphibian populations are here for many years to come. Let me go ahead and share my screen. And I'm also curious, uh, let me mute everybody. And Matthew, maybe you can take charge if someone wants to uh, talk. Um, all right, give me one second here. I can you confirm you can see my screen? There we are, Gary. I, I think I inadvertent, inadvertently muted you along with everybody else. Okay, sounds <laughs> good. It's like my first time using Zoom or something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, here we go. All right, thanks. My name is Harry Krieger. I'm the founder of Save the Frogs. And Save the Frogs is a nonprofit organization that I founded in 2008 as the world's first and only public charity dedicated exclusively to amphibian conservation. Our mission is to protect amphibian populations and to promote a society that respects and appreciates nature and wildlife. So I'm gonna start out with an introduction to amphibian conservation. I'm gonna be talking about the natural history and ecology of amphibians, some of the threats they face, how we all can help save them and why they're important. So the amphibians fall into five commonly known groups. The most um, common that we see in here are the frogs. So here's a Pacific chorus frog, one of the most um, popular frogs in the world because they end up in a lot of Hollywood movies. They live in California. So when there's frogs calling in a movie, it tends to be them. There's also the toads. Toads are actually just a type of frog. So frogs and toads actually fall toads very similar to um, what we normally think of as frogs and there's plenty of overlap but certain things that make them easy to tell are these um, large uh, parotid glands right here full of toxins bufo toxins that help protect the toad all right long toed salamanders the salamanders and the newts are the um, third and fourth groups of amphibians, though in reality, the newts are just a type of salamander. Newts tend to have a lot of toxins on their skin. Uh, maybe 15 or 20 years ago, one of these California ran to a coffee cup that someone was drinking from, and um, they did not. That did not end up well. So you can touch newts for certain, but wash your hands afterwards. And um, anytime you're dealing with a poisonous animal. Definitely don't stick your fingers in your eyes or your mouth. And Sicilians are the limbless amphibians. They tend to be fossorial. They live underground. They're not gathering around ponds and calling, so they're hard to find. And I have actually never seen a wild Sicilian. You've got to get pretty lucky. You got to be in the part of the world, the tropics usually, where they live and usually on a rainy day or night and just happen to come across one. All right, so this is a rainforest dragon. He's cool, but he's not an amphibian. Reptiles have scales, among other things. They've got hard shelled eggs when they do have eggs, whereas amphibians have, um, they, don't, they don't have the hard shell on the egg. The eggs are susceptible to desiccation. That's super important because that means the amphibians get active, they breed, they tend to hang out and live around water bodies. So these foothill yellow-legged frog eggs are in the bottom of a stream in California, same stream, it's actually Alameda Creek, has these California red-legged frog eggs. Amphibians, unlike reptiles, have metamorphosis. 
and they will have a tail. Uh, the tail does not drop off. They absorb it back into their body to use it for energy. Legs pop out, arms pop out, gills turn into lungs. They crawl out of the water. They'll usually be in a metamorph stage for perhaps a few weeks where they have, um, where they still resemble a tadpole and an adult frog somewhere in the middle. And they have external fertilization generally. Their mating embrace is called amplexus. And that's the male on top. Males are usually smaller than females. A big female can hold a lot of eggs. That seems to be preferred in the amphibian world. All right, amphibian skin is permeable. That's different than ours. Our skin's meant to protect us and keep things out. But amphibians can absorb oxygen and water directly through their skin. Some amphibians, especially in high mountain streams where there's a lot of dissolved oxygen, even as adults, they do not have lungs. They can get all their oxygen straight through their skin. We can tell a lot about amphibians by looking at their feet. Here we can see this red webbed gladiator frog. When they have webbing, they almost certainly spend a lot of time in the water to help them swim. And sometimes we'll be able to see toe pads if they're a tree frog to help them climb. What do frogs eat? They'll eat anything living that fits in their mouth. They're gape limited predators. So they're carnivores as adults. So it doesn't matter if it's a sack of insect eggs, another frog, a bird, snake, fish, flies, slug, whatever they catch and put in their mouth. If it's alive, they'll be happy to eat it. How many amphibian species exist worldwide? As of today, the number that I trust comes from the Amphibia Web website, 8,689 known species of amphibians, of which about 7,800 are frogs and toads, 800 are salamanders, and about 200 are scalions. So most of the amphibian world is frogs and toads. All right, so I grew up in Northern Virginia and I still go back and visit. Hopefully I'll be able to meet up with all of you sometime in Maryland, or I do sometimes hold some frogging Northern Virginia events, usually late April, right around Save the Frogs Day, which I'll be talking about, or early May. Uh, that's when there's a very good chance of a lot of frogs being out calling, though. Actually, I think we're kind of lucky in mid-Atlantic, at least, Around Northern Virginia, there's tons of frogs from April through probably July. All right, so I spent a lot of time, I still try to spend a lot of time down at the pond. And when I would go to sleep when I was young, I'd have the windows open and I'd be hearing gray tree frogs and other frogs coming subconsciously into my brain as I slept. And maybe that has something to do with. Uh, my career choice, green frogs, spring peepers. All right, we can see its cross on its back. That's where it gets its scientific name, Pseudac Pseudacris crucifer. Only male frogs call if they've got a big vocal sac extended like that, then it's a male frog. Oh, I'll say female frogs can call generous alarm call. I don't hear it too often, but um, usually, usually if you hear a frog calling, it's going to be a male. And that's their advertisement call. It's advertising their territory to other males and um, calling for a potential mate as well. All right, so in 2003, I went to Southeast Queensland, Australia. I spent four years there at Griffith University in Gold Coast, Australia, a great place to study amphibians. I was doing my PhD research on chytridiomycosis, a chytrid fungus that causes lots of problems for amphibians around the world. And I'd spend a lot of time out at Purling Brook Falls, go out at night because frogs there are pretty much exclusively nocturnal take a volunteer out, go around the top of the falls, hike down to the bottom, and there'd be about 10 species of frogs there calling. I would be trying to catch the ones of interest to me, catch them in a 20 by 25 centimeter um, 
plastic bag, sandwich bag, a standard kind of small sandwich bag for a small frog. And then that's actually makes it easier to catch the frog. It's hard for it to escape when it's got plastic around it versus jumping through your fingers. Um, and it also prevents the spreading of diseases. If I had to be handling a lot of frogs, I'd use a different bag on every frog. So anyway, I'd have to um, find the frog and catch it, meaning that just hearing them calling was not enough. But if you hear them calling and you can identify a frog, help you um, know what you're looking for. Cascade tree frogs. <laughs> Emerald spotted tree frogs, really beautiful eye, a lot of um, camouflage coloration on them. We can see their tree frogs. They've got those big toe pads. They even have some yellow markings in their webbing and um, under their, say, their armpits where I assume if they're spooked maybe during the day and they jump at yellow may scare off a predator. They have a descending cackle. Southern orange eye tree frog, my one of perhaps my favorite frog. It's our logo frog for Save the Frogs. They have almost no um, anti-predator response, which makes it easy to get right up in the face. They usually hang out around waterfalls deep in the rainforest. So I really like whenever these frogs are calling, which is usually when there's a ton of rain, a lot of rain in the rainforest by a rain uh, waterfall with a lot of frogs, cool place to be. Scarlet sided Pobblebonk, very happy frog. We can see that he does not have toe pads or webbing. They're living on the ground. They get the name because they bark, bark. Eastern sedge frog, a male. We can see the vocal sac. <coughs> they live in urban ponds, like runoff ponds, and they do fine living around people and houses. Great barred frog. We can see the bars on its legs. It's called great because it's a very large frog. Large frogs have deep calls. Or, or it's got a mosquito on his eye too. Marsh frog. They get their name because they have a stripe and they live in the marsh and their frog. Stripe marsh frog, perhaps the world's easiest frog call to make. So I hope everyone can... Uh, Make a frog call right now. It's like this. So feel free to do that on your own. Maybe we'll have a uh, frog chorus at the intermission. All right, marsupial frog, small frog, about the size of my thumbnail, full grown. You can imagine that this pouch right there by his back leg is very small. They'll fit about 10 or 15 um, froglets in there. They're a terrestrial breeding frog. They don't have tadpoles. They just lay their eggs in the moist leaf litter. The father takes care of the froglets for about days. Or so. All right, frog call contest. I'm up for that. Okay, so amphibians are really cool, but unfortunately, they're in a lot of trouble. There's about 2,000 amphibian species threatened with extinction. What's that mean? Threatened with extinction means that if we don't to remove the threats that they face, then we can expect them to go extinct in the near future. And there's also well over a thousand species that are considered data deficient. That means we don't know enough about what's going on with their populations to tell if they're doing all right or not. But usually, that these species are prone towards extinction. We usually don't know much about them because their population sizes are so small and they're hard to study. And if they have a small population, then they are at risk of extinction. So it's really probably a lot more than 2000 species. And that makes it well over a third of the amphibian species of the world are threatened with extinction. And at least 200 species have gone extinct since 1979 or so, which is an extinction rate several thousand times faster than we would expect. So if we want to save the frogs, we have to know why the frogs are in trouble. Number one problem, habitat destruction. 
especially frogs in the lowlands, because most people live in the lowlands, we tend to protect as national parks, the mountainous areas, they're hard to live in anyway. And then the lowlands get destroyed and there's tons of people there, a lot of competition. Here's a giant barred frog, another barred frog. There's five species of barred frogs in Australia, of which four are threatened with extinction. This being one cool golden eye. All right, so we need to protect wilderness. And that goes a huge way in helping amphibians. Uh, Save the Frogs was based in California, in Santa Cruz for many years. And out there, you've got the Santa Cruz long-toed salamanders, one of the most threatened salamander species, only 23 populations known. That's basically 23 different ponds where they live surrounded by really inhospitable terrain. They'd have to cross through, cross over roads, maybe get picked off by predators, dry up in the hot sun, et cetera. Um, I'm actually currently in Colombia right now, in Ibagué, Tolima, Colombia. And in Colombia, you've got a lot of sugar cane, monocultures, tend to not be good places for frogs. I visited this illegal well, I visited the national park in Bangladesh, Kadimnagar, cool place, but within the national park, there are illegal tea plantations. So just because we um, call something a national park, it still needs proper enforcement, which does not always happen in certain countries. All right, palm oil's kind of taken over the world in the last 20 years. Back when I created this slide, maybe 13 years ago, I thought there was probably, hey, a chance that we could boycott palm oil and maybe it would not become so popular, but it appears to be in um, tons of stuff. And they don't even call it palm oil anymore. They just call it vegetable oil, probably on purpose so that people consuming it won't have any um, reason to not buy it. But usually if something just says vegetable oil, I'm gonna take my bet that it's palm oil. And there's a reason they're not telling you what kind of vegetable oil it is. Anyway, palm oil, um, especially in places like this in Malaysia, um, huge amounts of deforestation, burning the uh, jungle afterwards, a lot of pollution, and then um, growing monocultures of palm. Gold mining, here, this is in Ghana, this is illegal gold mining, lots of pollution gets in that water and lots of destruction of the forest. All right, frogs get taken out of the wild for use as pets, especially brightly colored species, poison dart frogs. Um, here in Colombia, there's definitely a problem with people exporting, illegally stealing frogs from the wild, sending them to places generally like Germany and perhaps the United States and Japan. All right, here it is, the most um, toxic frog that there is, the strongest poison known of any frog, Phyllobates terribilis. Frog legs, about a billion frogs eaten worldwide each year. That's clearly unsustainable. And even in America, a lot of frogs get eaten. Fortunately, not California red-legged frogs anymore, but they nearly got eaten to extinction by the California gold miners. Still plenty of pig frogs and bullfrogs getting harvested in the southeast US, but most of the um, commerce frogs is now coming from frog farms, which I will uh, talk about later. Invasive species, trout, non-native fish get stocked into high mountain ponds where tadpoles and frogs have no evolved defenses against them. against them. They can completely wipe out frog populations like the mountain yellow-legged frogs in California, gone from about 93% of their native ponds. A red swamp crayfish, problematic in California and the Iberian Peninsula as well. They're native to the southeastern US. They like to eat frogs. The American bullfrog, native to the eastern half of the USA and Canada, so no problem there, but they're unfortunately invasive species in at least 15 different countries, mostly from frog farming. They're big frog, big frogs have big legs, they're probably the most um, economically um, 
beneficial frog for a frog farmer. So they're in lots of places they escape the frog farms. Big frogs have big mouths. Frogs like to eat whatever they can put in their mouth. They've got a big appetite. They like to eat native wildlife and they do a really good job spreading diseases like chytridiomycosis because the chytrid fungus usually doesn't kill them. It just lives on their skin in high quantities and that means they're really good vectors. And when they're coming in, the frog farms are super densely packed with lots of other frogs and then they get shipped in buckets lots of frogs crawling all over each other perfect disease spreading conditions pollution and pesticides all of that chemical soup ends up down in the water where the frogs live and breed maybe it goes up into the air it'll come back down in rainfall and atrazine number one most commonly detected pesticide in u.s groundwater rainwater and tap water still legal banned in the in the European Union since 2004. Global warming, climate change affects amphibians when there is less rain, especially things drying up, ponds drying up in Yellowstone National Park, persistent droughts over the last half century causing problems for amphibians. Also, cloud forests in the tropics, what happens is the earth warms up, the cloud levels rise. And those amphibians that need moist leaf litter to put their eggs in, that leaf litter is no longer that moist. Infectious diseases, especially the chytrid fungus, Batrachochytrium dendrobatitis, causing huge problems, probably driven about 100 amphibian species to complete extinction. That makes chytridium mycosis the worst disease in recorded history. And here's another barred frog, Flay's barred frog, threatened by the chytrid fungus. They live in high mountain streams. Chytrid fungus tends to have its most significant impact on amphibians that live in high mountain streams. Chytrid fungus does really well in cool, wet places. All right, frogs are important. Why so? They're eating ticks, mosquitoes, flies, and other disease vectors spreading West Nile virus, dengue fever, malaria, leishmaniasis, other diseases we don't want. The frogs are taking care of that, at least as much as they can, helping us out, helping us stay healthy. So thank you to the frogs for that. They're an integral part of the food web. Um, they're food for birds, fish, snakes, monkeys, dragonflies, beetles, etc. Lots of animals eat and depend on amphibians. And if the amphibians disappear, those species may have trouble too. This is a stony and that was my main frog that I was studying in Australia. I had various species, but this one was the uh, most common. They go bright yellow, the males do in breeding season, and they generally don't call. They live on streams, on rocky streams where the forest canopy is not too thick. So there's usually probably enough light for that yellow color to be visible. And then they don't have to call. Calling is pretty dangerous for a frog. It's basically advertising their presence, not just to other frogs, but to predators as well. All right, we got a lot of medical benefit from the continued existence of amphibians. About 10% of Nobel Prizes have gone to researchers whose work depended on frogs. This frog right here, southern orange-eyed tree frog, once again, they've got antimicrobial peptides on their skin that can kill HIV. All right, frogs are bioindicators. They're telling us about the state of our environment. They're bioindicators. They've got permeable skin. Uh, they cannot fly off to a new location like a bird hang out in one basic spot. So if they destroyed. If wetland gets drained, if the forest gets chopped down, then they've got trouble. They're amphibious. They're dependent, most of them, on both healthy land and water. So if either has problems, then the frogs may decline in numbers. All right, frogs have been around for hundreds of millions of years, a lot longer than us. They've got as much right to be here as we do. Frogs are cool. So there's plenty of reasons to save the frogs. And Fortunately, there are lots of ways to save the frogs. It's up to you and to me, everyone out there, to save the frogs. We are um, 
frog educated, or at least we're um, a lot more frog educated, I hope, than we were 20 or so minutes ago. And I've got a lot more coming up. Um, actually, you know what? I'm not quite there to this uh, intermission we spoke of. Um, how can we save the frogs? Don't use pesticides. If you're a homeowner for certain, then I'm careful what you're spraying around your house. Eat locally grown organic food when possible. Locally grown, it didn't have to get shipped a long way using lots of fuel. And change organic food, no pesticides on it. And I'm actually happy I was thinking about this when this slide just came up here. Not only that, it looks like a tasty salad, um, but there's plenty of places in the world that I go and give this talk where I say, hey, eat locally grown organic food. People don't really have that option, but fortunately, in the United States, in most places, we do have the option to buy lo and eat locally grown organic food. So take advantage of that if you can. Don't eat frog legs for certain. Slow down driving on wet nights. Pickerel frog there did not end up well with the collision that was in Charlottesville, Virginia. If you see one frog on a wet night in spring or summer, probably going to be more. Slow down. Don't purchase wild caught amphibians. Don't stock non native frog fish in your pond or spring. Try to plant all native plants as well. The more native you go on your own property, your property you manage, the better. Turn off the tap and yeah, the eastern U.S., there tends to be plenty of rain. Western U.S., rivers get dried out. Colorado River doesn't make it to the sea, usually. Murray-Darling River in Australia does not make it to the sea. All that irrigation, not good for frogs. Here we've got the Stony Creek frogs again. As I mentioned before, the males go yellow, sexually dichromatic and dimorphic. The females are much larger than the males and much browner as well in the mating season. Don't purchase bottled water. Um, I lost track of the number, but billions of bottles of water being sold every year. The bottling process is pretty bad on the environment and uses a lot of water from the stream just to create the plastic on top of the transportation. Use rechargeable batteries, especially if you're going out looking for frogs. It's a uh, frog biologists who use a lot of batteries and you can get rechargeable batteries that you almost never have to purchase new ones. Um, normal batteries have lots of bad heavy metals. So be careful how you dispose of them when that time comes. Vote for the environment. There was a time when uh, politicians spoke about and acknowledged the existence of the environment tends to not be on too many politicians' mind. That probably comes from their constituents. So if we are not talking about the environment, they are not going to be talking about the environment, most likely. So, but do your best and um, find a politician who cares about the environment. Consider voting for them. Eat less meat, especially cows. Everywhere I go where I see cows, there's not forest there. Usually the forest got chopped down in order to have cows and or the cows prevent the forest from regenerating. All right, pursue a career in environmental conservation. If you're still looking for a career, a career change, plenty of jobs, not just biology, but environmental law, environmental management and environmental education. All right, spread the word about the amphibian extinction crisis. If people don't know that amphibians are in trouble, and people don't care, then we're gonna have a whole lot of trouble. I've always considered environmental education to be at the root of environmental conservation. All right, so that is the um, first half of my presentation. I'm gonna change screens while this is up. I'll say, hey, savethefrogs.com. I built the website and I've been adding to it for the past uh, 15 years or so. There's tons of information on there. Go use the search bar at the top, type in whatever you're interested in learning about, or just click some links. And uh, maybe I'll talk some more about the site later. Let me end this right now and take some questions. It looks like we've got uh, 25. 
I can't tell how many people, 30 people on. That's good. Thanks, everyone, for being here. If you showed up late, I am Save the Frogs founder, Dr. Carrie Krieger. Any questions, send them in right now. And um, I'm going to set up my other slideshow, and I'll be back in about 15 seconds, we'll say. I wish I could offer a prize for anyone who asks questions, but I don't have prizes to give. It's it's all right. That means I've been thorough. I think everyone's still uh, apparently here. All right, let's translate the science into action. All right, tell me when you can see this screen. Save the frogs. That's it. That's the one. Okay. All right. So. I am going to talk about the, the work that Save the Frogs does and has been doing for a long time. We do have a late breaking question. Yeah, I see that. The question is, I look for wood frogs every spring. Are they endangered? I tend to think of wood frogs as fairly common. Um, that being said, I in my life have not seen too many, um, but interestingly, um, where I grew up, on the property i've still never seen a wood frog but two years ago or maybe a year and a half was a wood frog sighted about a mile away and then this summer i saw two frogs nearby we'll say i'm um, about half a mile away two wood frogs so maybe they're expanding south they tend to be a bit um you know up in northern states so but i don't think that they are endangered All right, so Save the Frogs, translating science into action. That's been our goal. Take my um, knowledge that I acquired during my um, PhD research years and all of those scientific publications I read that gave suggestions on what needed to be done that always made me think, okay, that's good, but who's doing that? And my goal was to uh, start Save the Frogs and start doing some of those things that need to get done to protect amphibians. For the first 18 months of Save the Frogs, we were pretty much exclusively in our education because, as I said, if people don't know and people don't care, you're going to have a whole lot of trouble getting things done. One of the first things that I did was to start Save the Frogs Day. This slide is a bit out of date. It's actually April 28th every year we have changed dates a few times. April 28th every year, they've got the 16th annual Save the Frogs Day coming up April 28th, 2024. I encourage all of you to um, take part. Maybe you can set up an event for um, fellow Marylanders and educate them about amphibians, maybe go for an amphibian hike or come on down to Virginia if I hold another frogging Northern Virginia event right around Save the Frogs Day. So since 2009, we've had at least 1,500 educational events taking place in 58 countries. And we've got all kinds of different things happen on Save the Frogs Day. 2011, I led a rally slash protest in front of the EPA in Washington, D.C. We had about 40 people show up to call for a ban on atrazine, which um, I did not mention. Why is atrazine a concern, especially to people who are about frogs because it's an endocrine disruptor and can turn male frogs into females at two and a half parts per, per billion. And as I said, it's <laughs> Your, your audio just kind of went crazy there. <laughs> you, you for just a sec, sorry. All 
All right, testing, testing. That seems better. Okay, good. I don't know why, but I had to disconnect and reconnect. Sorry about that. Thanks. Yeah, it's all right. Okay, um, I'm not sure what you heard, but I've been to the U.S. Atrazine is an endocrine disruptor. Yeah. I think then you'd move down and we lost yeah. you after that. All right, yeah, I've been to the U.S. EPA several times to speak to their scientists about it. Unfortunately, um, there's a massive, well-funded lobby from the um, agriculture industry that probably makes billions of dollars selling it and using it. So um, no significant changes, unfortunately, with that in the United States. All right, other Save the Frogs Day events, we've had habitat restoration events. This is a local school and high school in Santa Cruz and people came out to help. Oh, I did not have pictures of that. I thought there it is. Habitat restoration for California red frogs at this pond. There's non-native uh, weeds, non-native fish, non-native crayfish, non-native frogs, all kinds of bad things going on there. But yeah, people helping out for the California red-legged frogs. Um, <laughs> again let me how's this now That's better. okay okay i changed mics so we'll see what happens <laughs> sorry about that yeah, it's all right um let's see yeah if people live in cities say you live in baltimore maryland it's possible you don't like going out at night and you don't like going out on rainy nights. You may never see a wild frog. So getting people out into nature, good way to make them care about frogs. Uh, tons of schools educating their students about frogs on Save the Frogs Day. This is in Nepal and frog art being created at the school in Vermont. And we've got kids organizing events too. Avalon. She's now probably 25 or so, um, but she was holding events for probably 10 years down in Florida, educating tons of people about amphibians on Save the Frogs Day. The first ever national seminar on frogs in Nepal was held on the occasion of the third annual Save the Frogs Day. Here's a, a rally to raise awareness in South Africa and some frog dancing going on in Korea. This is at the site of a wetland where the government had been planning to um, build high-rise apartments north of Seoul. And a group who invited me to visit them in Korea and give presentations, um, they helped stop that construction. All right, a uh, university group in Uganda. This is me in Medellin. That was 10 years ago, and at one of the main science museums, I had a table up educating passersby, and then I gave a presentation in the auditorium. We've had 5K runs in Seattle, uh, 260 runners. We had several amphibian biologists giving presentations. The frogs at Yosemite National Park with Ranger Rick and the National Wildlife Federation. And in Bangladesh, they like holding uh, froggy rallies with their froggy caps, they call them, and walking through the urban centers, raising awareness, and then oftentimes uh, holding field trips out to the uh, jungle to find some frogs. All right, we've also given a lot of grants to assist groups in holding Save the Frogs events. And this is one of them in Nigeria. All right, we have another question and I'll go ahead and answer it. In the Eastern US, can we say frogs are mostly diurnal, nocturnal, or totally species dependent? I'd say they're definitely primarily uh, nocturnal from my experience. Frogs that tend to be out in the day, in my experience would be in the tropics, there would be poison dart frogs are out during the day. They probably get some benefit from showing their coloration during the day when other animals can see them. And they don't have to worry about hiding in the darkness. 
And then there's also plenty of uh, leaf litter frogs that will be out during the day. And that would certainly increase if it were a rainy day. All right, another Save the Frogs Day event. This was a bullfrog removal, non-native bullfrogs, American bullfrogs in California where they don't belong. And Santa Marta, Columbia, Beto Reda professor takes his students out to um, teach them how to sample for chytrid fungus up in the mountains. There's Adelopus frogs there. Um, many of the Adelopus species have disappeared. And Save the Frogs Day also gets a lot of good publicity. Front cover of Le Monde, the largest paper in France. France, where it's illegal to eat a native frog because they all eat most of their native frogs. Uh, Two-minute spot on CNN Worldwide TV. And plenty of politicians spreading the word about Save the Frogs Day through official proclamations recognizing the day. Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina. That was Nikki Haley right there officially um, recognized Save the Frogs Day. Michigan, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, and various cities around the world. All right, so um, various activities of mine for Save the Frogs include giving presentations like these, originally all in person now, a lot of them online. I've given nearly 500 presentations with 24,000 plus attendees. These are at schools, universities, government agencies, community groups, getting the word out, trying to get people actively saving the frogs. Uh, we had a uh, San Francisco Tadpole Head Start program. We'd visit schools in San Francisco. There'd be another group, Tree Frog Treks, that would um, bring in some tadpoles that they were um, head starting the tadpoles and the kids could see the tadpoles and have them in their class for a while before they get released into the wild. Uh, Fairfax, California Manor School. We were actually planning to build a wetland at this school. It was all ready to go. We had scientists from around the world, experts coming in and a day before we were set to build after we thought we had all the permissions we need according to the school, the uh, superintendent of the county schools or whatever, the superintendent of the school board there called us to um, cancel the whole thing. He was afraid that there'd be spiders and other um, things that he did not like that would start showing up around the school. So unfortunately, not, not everybody cares much about saving the frogs, but these kids were, were very, Money uh, amphibian species last chat. I see the audio is breaking up a lot, Carrie. Can you? Um, I'm not sure what the issue is. It's different than last time, so that's something. I think there's some connection issues here. We'll just wait. Hi. Yeah, hi, one second here. Mm hmm. Hello, let me know if it gets any better. It's like my computer's freezing up. It's only slightly better, unfortunately. Hello. Okay, what about now? I closed, I closed down PowerPoint. Had it for a minute. All right. Oh, we got a power problem. One second. Mm -hmm. yeah, one yeah, second. yeah. It's all good.
okay. Right? It still says it on table. I was actually planning on connecting on different places and forgetting this on slideshow for a bit because I think my computer is kind of uh, you know, up or something. I see it all standing. So, well, pretty glitchy. Right? Actually, connect on another device. I think. Yeah, but not trustworthy. I think you said you were in Colombia, so I guess this is to be expected. Hi. Hmm. Hi. Um, hi. Hello. Can you unmute here? Unmute. It's 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 pretty bad still. I'm sorry to say. Although I see there are two of you now. So I can I can see you talking now, but I can't hear you. It looks like you're muted on your new. All right. Good. Hello. Okay, tentatively working. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna get okay. out of the way. Okay, I'm gonna close my computer, and we're gonna change this up because I think my computer uh, froze up, and you can now hear me just fine. Is that right? So far, so good. Okay, good. Let me uh, kind of. I appreciate set your this patience, Gary. Oh this must be frustrating for you. It's all right. Okay, good. So um, let's see. Before I continue, since I don't have my slides in front of me at the moment, how about we just reopen this up to questions? Does anyone have any questions? A couple of them in the chat, I think. Okay. So there was one question asking about... Um how many donations you get from countries other than the U.S., because we can see you're doing outreach all over the world. And then there's a question uh, okay. asking for guidance on how we can create frog-friendly habitats in our own backyards to help conserve and protect yeah. frog species. Okay. And I think well, you can see there's another one Let's just go in order. Donations? Yeah. I have not done an exact assessment of that, but it's definitely primarily USA based donors. I can't think of any large donations that have come from other countries, though um, our uh, work in Ghana, we were active in Ghana from 2011 to 2020 or so and had a um, separate organization called Save the Frogs Ghana that applied and received grants from lots of organizations in uh, UK, Germany, Saudi Arabia. So there's definitely plenty of funders. I'm not applying for grants too often. Most of the money for Save the Frogs just comes from individual donations who, you know, people send in a donation through the website. Occasionally we get a large check in the mail. And most of them come from the USA, but we definitely have had some donors from various countries. And um, yeah, we have a Save the Frog shop gift center online with shirts and stickers and flags and all kinds of cool things, tote bags, and we get orders from around the world. We also have eco tours and... and those are usually for about 10 days. We'll go to some frog friendly, frog full habitats. Lots of frogs in places is um, where we try to go. So, so far that's been Belize, Costa Rica, Ecuador, and Peru. And those raise money for our efforts too. And we definitely have some people from outside the U.S. join on those tours. Uh, if you're interested in joining a Save the Frogs eco tour, we don't have dates set yet, but we're working on um, planning out the next couple years worth of eco tours and those what were um, highly likely to be in Ecuador, Costa Rica, Colombia, Zambia, South Africa, and Malaysia. 
So we have a page, savethefrogs.com slash ecotours. And if you're interested, then uh, check that out. Send me a message. Anyone, you can contact me. I'm Carrie at savethefrogs.com or just go to the contact page of the website and it'll probably make its way to me. And then the next question. I believe you your contact information habitat? is in the event description on our site too. Okay, good. How can you build frog-friendly habitats? What I would do is go to savethefrogs.com and um, right at the top, I think I'm not looking at the site, but it probably says create account or start here. You can create yourself an account or go to savethefrogs.com slash academy, Save the Frogs Academy, and it'll definitely be up there. Create yourself a free account. You'll get 28 days free, full access to Save the Frogs Academy online courses. And we have a course in there called Wetlands. And if you go through all of that, you'll definitely have a really good idea on how to build a wetland. How big does a wetland have to be? That could just be something like five feet across, five foot diameter, maybe even smaller. Depending on where you are and what species are there, there are plenty of, there usually tend to be species that can use a very small water body like that. There's no fish in it. Frogs like places without fish and safer to be. Though, if you have a lot more land, then you could build a large wetland. If you um, type in wetlands in the search bar of our site, you'll see a lot of articles on wetlands, including wetlands that we built. And those tend to be 20 30 feet across and uh i know as i sh showed before i grew up with a pond on the property my parents built that pond and i certainly enjoyed it a lot and as i said it probably had a um, lot to do with my career choice so i think having a wetland around is good for you know good for kids growing up and good for frogs as well Oh, but aside from that and going, aside from just sending it to the website, what can you do? You can build a wetland, you can plant native vegetation, you can reforest. I like visiting in, especially in the tropics. I go to a lot of places where they tell me this used to be cow pasture. We're like in a forest and they tell me it used to be cow pasture. And I say, oh, how long ago was that? Five years, 10 years. So it doesn't take that long. If you just let the let the earth, let the land regenerate and the forest will grow. And that's one of the best things you can do. If you have, you know, there's grass that was there because you bought the property and it just happens to be grass. Well, let some of that regrow into a forest and that's going to help out a lot. Creating wetlands, uh, you can create toad abodes, just pile up some rocks that have some space in there for toads to kind of hide in and toads will make use of those. Um, and then just, you know, keeping clean, clean property as far as not using pesticides and pollutants and that'll go a long way. All right. I saw a, uh, a question come in. Can you read off to me if there's new questions? Uh, yeah. So there's one, um, Anne says, glad to see you participate in actions such as atrazine protest. I have done frog watch for community science data collection for several years. The habitats, three vernal pool, three vernal ponds were on state property, but each one was destroyed by dredging, filling, and road construction. I uh, reached out to Maryland Department of the Environment, but to no avail. What kind of actions would you suggest? How do we as citizens make this happen? Okay. Yeah. Usually like someone will write me concerned about some piece of land that has frogs getting destroyed or set to get destroyed. So usually what I'd suggest is first try to figure out what amphibians are on the property. And if there's someone, you know, if it's a governmental agency, I'm sure that they would have had to do some kind of assessments there and that that would be public records but one way or another find out what amphibians are there if there's nothing endangered there then you are probably going to have some problems trying to stop something at least 
as far as using the law. Um, if there's something in danger there, though, then I would contact the local, like Maryland Department of Natural Resources or Fish and Wildlife, whatever it happens to be called there, your county Fish and Wildlife Commission, um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. I'd start contacting all of the government agencies that look over that part of the world, let them know, see what they have to say about it. And aside from that, say that there's nothing in danger there, but you still want to stop it, then it kind of becomes a uh, public education campaign. I'd start speaking at your local city council meetings or county council, whatever it happens to be. There's usually like a monthly meeting where members of the public can speak for a minute or two and I'd start going to those. I'd build a website. I like building websites to get the word out and start making use of, uh, you know, all your communications options. You could hold a protest there. So it's all just, you know, it's kind of different levels of how, how serious are you about it? How much are you willing to do? And how long, how persistent will you be? Because a lot of these things drag on for years. So um, one thing, if I get my slideshow up and my computer appears to have restarted on its own, so I could try. Um, I've been working on a campaign to stop the state of California from giving out permits for the importation of non-Native American bullfrogs. There's about two, two million bullfrogs imported in the state each year. And I've been speaking at those governmental events for 13 years, 13 and a half years, and taking part in governmental panels and stakeholder meetings and all kinds of things. And so it's unfortunate. I, if I had known it would be a 13 year thing, I'm not sure I would have gotten started. But once you've been doing it for a long time, you want to see it through to completion, which it always appears we're getting a little bit closer, getting the politicians a little bit more educated, getting them to care a little bit more which has been a long, a long process. So you got to stick with it. So uh, Frankie asks, do you have any frogs? I have never had a pet, anything. You travel around a lot. That might make it hard, huh? That would definitely uh, make it tricky, yeah. Passing uh, inspection checkpoints at borders and things like that would be difficult. Uh, another question here. Generally speaking, do you think terrestrial breeding frogs are more or less at risk than their aquatic counterparts? Yeah, I would put them lesser at risk and that was part of my phd research on chytridiomycosis one of my projects that's published in diversity and distributions was um examining frogs that live in different that have different breeding modes of breeding so streams permanent ponds ephemeral ponds terrestrial breeders that don't use ponds at all and um as far as chytrid goes, that's because, as I said before, chytrid likes water. It likes wet places. There, it has waterborne zoospores. So, um, terrestrial breeding frogs should be better off. But at the same time, if it's, if chytrid's not the threat, then it all just comes down to what kind of land is getting destroyed it may be easier to be destroying the forest than to be up in stream beds and steep valleys and things like that in which case the frogs that live in the forest away from the streams may have trouble a couple more uh so rich wants to know why would anyone import bullfrogs fair question is it just because they're so okay. big is that why people like them as pets with mostly not for pets so that is possible you can order online from you know your biological supply, you can get frogs for your classrooms, um, frogs for dissections. But the biggest thing is uh, people eating the frogs. So they're, they're raised on the frog farms, usually these days, Taiwan, China, um, some in South America, but mostly Southeast Asia. And then they get imported into the U.S. as... Um, you know, frogs for 
a lot of Asian restaurants, but also French restaurants, um, roadhouses, bar and grill, get your beer and your frog legs because people may think it's funny. And, you know, there's plenty of that that takes place. America actually has a long history of frog leg eating. There's the Felsmere Frog Leg Festival in Florida that I assume still goes on. I have not looked into it lately, but their website said that the kids in their town were bored So they decided to uh, have a frog like festival and eat tons of frogs. Another question. Uh, Alan Googled you and saw that you also play Indian music. Do you ever integrate your interest in frogs into your music or vice versa? Now I'm imagining like sitar playing with frog sounds in the background, which could be pretty cool. Yeah. Who's your favorite sitar player? Uh, well, I'm totally basic, and Ravi Shankar is like the only one that comes to mind. <laughs> right, I assume that would be the case. So I actually studied Bonsuri. Uh-oh. Let's uh, take care of that first. Um, I play the Bonsuri. I also played tabla, which is the drum that would accompany it. And right. um, Ravi Shankar taught my teacher for 30 years. So a lot of my music comes straight from the uh, Ravi Shankar tradition. So, yeah, I usually don't, I'll say, but I do, um, you know, occasionally play at an event right now and I'll play something right now, but I need to, uh, I need to see, I need to get a sound and maybe I won't. I'll, yeah, there's the sound. Oh yeah, here it is. Enable original sound. Let's see if this comes comes through here sound check does that come through sadly no no nothing okay all right well i will uh leave it at that we'll uh, have I to have google my... it are there recordings yeah, online google, put in carrie krieger flute and you'll get a you'll get uh plenty of my music coming up and another time, maybe I'll have a better sound system. So, but are are there frogs incorporated into the into the music? I think is what the question wanted to know. No, but I do have a, a um a um partially released album called Flute for for the Fro Flute at the Frog Pond, and I recorded it down at the pond that I showed you the pictures of because right. I like to go down there and play music, and um yeah, so you can hear like it'll start, you'll be able to hear the frogs in the background of it. Very cool. Any that, frog related questions? Yeah, that might be it for questions. Okay, let me try one more time to get my, uh, let's see if my computer is oh, working have one, as we have expected one more. now. How, how, do they, how do they clean frogs? Frankie asks. How do you clean a frog as far as cleaning, like clean a fish, do you mean? Like clean the insides? I'm not sure. I don't I don't think that's what she means. I've never been do, asked that question before. Do they take the Poland off? How do you disinfect a frog? How do you treat how do you treat a, okay, how do you treat a like sick a, frog? Right okay. after you've handled yeah. them. Okay. Well, if I'm going to handle it, if I, I mean, I usually don't touch frogs. It's rare that I touch frogs. And, oh, here I am again. Let me hold up here. Oh, wait, the question was, uh, how do you clean a frog before you eat it? I guess I'm getting a little macabre here. Can see you, but can't hear you. Nope.
Well, we'll try to think of some more questions while we're waiting for you to recover your microphone. I can see your hand, Carrie. I'm not sure what you're asking me to do, though. I'm sorry. If you can type in the chat, I can I can read it. Hello. Oh, hi. Maybe go ahead and make me a co-host, and then that won't. Oh, are you not a co-host? Yeah, that would do it. I chat. Well, well because you yeah because you left and came back. Let's see here. That might that might make a difference. Yeah. So figure out which one you are. Yeah. Mm. Um. Let's see. I forgot now. What was? Oh yeah, I was back. It, it in fact was about cleaning frogs, frogs before you eat them. You them. Okay, yeah, I don't eat them, so I don't clean them, and I don't eat them. So the answer I is you really don't. Know. You shouldn't do that. <laughs> um, Apparently, yeah, I don't. I don't. Um, let's see. How do you disinfect a frog, though? Because someone did ask. Oh, how do you clean the fungus off of it? I'm not. I wouldn't want to do that. I thought you meant how, how do you disinfect it? I'll go ahead and answer that. The, um, the original question if, you were about to answer is just fine. Yeah. Yeah. If you if you have a wild population of frogs and there's in, infection there, it's very hard to get rid of chytrid fungus. You could, if it's a small population and there's no other frogs coming in there, not many of them, you could potentially go out there and grab every frog and stick it in a fungicidal bath of itraconazole. I'm not sure if I'm saying that correctly. If you're in a lab, you could do that, or you could heat the frog up to the point where the chytrid fungus dies, which is probably around 30 Celsius, 86 or so Fahrenheit. Go up above that where the frog's not going to die, but the fungus dies, and that can clear the infection. So that's fine for lab frogs or captive frogs, but out in the wild, it's very difficult. That's why I say the frog is always focused on how can you um, prevent the diseases from entering. So that's why I focus on um, California bullfrogs. It's such an easy thing. If you just stop giving out the permits for the importation of the bullfrogs, then you're going to have a whole lot less disease coming into the state. So how how easily is this fungus spread? I mean, like if you if you're in the ha in the territory where the frogs are, does it get stuck to your boots and your gear and things, and you have to disinfect yourself before you go to the next? Yeah, it def it definitely could. If you're in a, uh, I'll say, the more endangered the frogs that you're studying, in the higher the importance of disinfecting your boots if you were just in some other watershed would be so but as far as like the reality of how easily can we stop the spread from watershed to watershed uh there's all kinds of people outside of the amphibian world who are making use of you know the water there's fishermen there's trucks crossing streams and there's i'm not i'm not sure how much impact it has but definitely you know be cautious if you're going into critically endangered frog habitat, then ideally, you know, take some new boots, disinfect your tools. If you have tools, go there first. Like, don't go to the visit the other frog sites first. Go straight to the endangered frogs that you're clean when you go in there. But as far as how easily does it spread? Easily, because there, well, there's, a hundred million frogs shipped intercontinentally every year for pets, food, bait, laboratory, and zoos. And there's very little disease testing or quarantine that takes place. There's very few regulations in most countries. There's none for bringing frogs in. Um, and then the frogs get released or the water they were held in gets released. And the kitter does a really good job surviving in lots of conditions.
and it does a really good job infecting lots of different amphibian species. Yeah, got it. Um, so it's regrettable that we had all of the issues with the technology, but it seems like we're where we should be now. It is it's about eight fifteen. So what what do you think? Like what what's the takeaway here? Okay. We will all check out your website, of course, and we can find a bunch more information yeah. out there. But what's the one thing you want us to to leave here? Yeah, with today? I I talked. I talked a lot about frogs. I didn't talk too much about Save the Frogs and what we do, which is the second half. Um, we've done a lot of political advocacy. We've um, gotten um, local, state, and federal legislation in place to protect frogs. Um, we have a lot of ways for people to take part. So we just, um, our art contest just ended at least the 2023. It's a really good way to get students involved. We've had think about 23,000 entries from 117 countries over the years. Um, so if you're affiliated with an art school or any school, one good way to get your students involved is get them in uh, taking part in the Save the Frogs art contest. It does go year round. It's just we won't judge again until the end of 2024. Right now, um, I saw that Bridget Kiernicki is on the call. I'm not sure if she's a normal member of your group or if she heard about this from Save the Frogs, but I saw that she had submitted a photo to the Save the Frogs photo contest, which is going through December 1st. So if you're um, into frog photography and have some good photos, then uh, please do enter savethefrogs.com slash photo. Yeah, I think, I think the takeaway is uh, you're all pretty educated on frog right now, certainly more than the average person. Um, you guys have a well-established group and the ability to spread the word um so yeah what i what i always like people you know the if you're going to hold one frog event in a year then say the frogs day is a good time to do that please register your event then we know about it and can help promote it and we know you know what happened and that it took place yeah. um yeah maybe one of these days i'll be able to come up there um in, Love that. in virginia or we could meet halfway or something just, we could... <laughs> yeah okay. it's we'll we'll figure it out in the future it'd be good to meet up and yeah, we'll yeah take touch. people out take people out to find frogs spread the word about amphibians educate yourself on save the frogs .com. go um get your 28 days free of save the frogs academy access or you can become a save the frogs member either by donation or if you cannot afford that, we have Save the Frog scholarships. So you could apply for a scholarship oh, nice. and that would cover your Save membership and get you indefinite access to Save the Frogs Academy and some other benefits. Uh, we have a Save the Frogs gift center. So if you're looking for some holiday amphibian themed gifts that um, help save frogs and savefrogs.com slash shop, and if you have any projects or know someone who does have projects that need funding related to amphibians, we give out grants. We've given out about $130,000 worth of grant funding over the years to amphibian conservationists in 20 plus countries or so. And those um, applications are accepted in the month of February. So savefrogs.com okay. slash grants. Um, yeah. Lots of ways. If you just spend spend an hour on the website, you'll find plenty of stuff of interest and you'll get a whole lot of ideas about what you can do. And um, we have a page for volunteers to save the fries.com slash volunteers if you want to get more actively involved. Nice. That's great. Thank you so much. The photo contest deadline yeah. is December 1st, you said? Correct. Do you yep. do you have a do you it's have a free to enter or for like do you have a special category for like a crummy five-year-old iPhone with terrible resolution? <laughs> we don't have technology. We don't have device categories. Oh man. We've got, we could, but we could, we're, we reserve the right to create a crummy iPhone five category. Um, but yeah, we have like um, frogs and toads, salamanders and newts, Sicilians, and then I think there was one more. I can't remember what it what it I was. I think I'm going to go but, for the know, Sicilian category because I imagine there's not many entrants in that one since they're so hard to find. I don't think we've ever had one. Well, there you go. So, yeah, there's take an... you know, if you <laughs> well, don't sweep already that category. Have a photo, yeah, you could. You could win best iPhone five Sicilian 
photographer. I have a goal now. Thank you, Carrie. That was awesome. Um, so last call for questions, anyone, before we wrap this up? We'd love to keep in touch with you, Carrie, uh, and we'll try to set up some other events in the future. I really appreciate all that you do um, and you're spreading awareness and coming to speak to us about the work and getting us all involved. That's really helpful. Um, thanks so much for your time. And I hope that yeah. the rest of your field work that you're doing goes well and uh, we'll hear from you soon. Thanks. All right. Take, thanks, Have everyone. Night, Take care. Everybody. All right. Bye.